Hello, I'm Nelson Liu, and thanks for joining us for Western Perspective. Well, he's the last candidate nominating to be mayor for the city of Perth, and he wants to be in the job for you. Bruce Reynolds has vowed to be the voice of residents and businesses in the city if elected, stating he knows the community and its needs because he's been a part of it for many years. This week, we talked to Bruce about his aspirations for the top job and his goal for the city of Perth. Bruce Reynolds, welcome to WP. Hello, how are you? Nice to meet you. So, why do you choose to run last minute? Last minute? Basically, I was waiting and watching the campaign unfold. Um, and effectively, as the campaign unfolded, and I just didn't align strongly enough with the candidates. Individually, I thought the candidates were outstanding people and had outstanding facets to their careers. But I just felt like we needed someone of a little bit more rounded body um, to their careers. And uh, when that didn't happen, then I decided, uh, instead of complaining about the process, that it was, uh, it was up to me to put my hand up. So there must be something that you felt that they're missing, and they haven't delivered, that's why you run, is that right? And to a degree, yeah, absolutely. So I'm a stakeholder in the City of Perth. I started working in the City of Perth as a 15-year-old and I did an apprenticeship. As a 24-year-old, I started one of my businesses and then got to the stage now where I run three businesses concurrently. For the last 20 years, I've been involved with the non-for-profit sector quite heavily through my heart and hands, helping and um, volunteering all the way up through to you know board and chair levels. Um, so I just... Listening to some of the conversations in the forums and some of the things in the press releases, I just felt I was getting just a little bit angsty about uh, about some of those conversations and also our role as um, as a council and a mayoral candidate uh, within a council. Um, so we need to make sure that we understand fully what our obligations are to our ratepayers and our employees, if you like, which are the stakeholders of the City of Perth. That includes the whole state because the City of Perth is a jewel of the crown of Western Australia and whilst our ratepayers uh, fund the, the internal runnings of the, of, of the actual city, we still have to you know, obviously look after and be custodians of the city for the whole of Western Australia. What makes you angsty when it comes to conversations? Well, some of the conversations around the homeless, for instance, um, having a non-for-profit background and understanding that. Some of the um, some of the conversations around. I won't say generally it's the way forums are run. You've got two or three minutes to say your spiel, and it's almost like a classroom president type thing where the the promises seem to be to be get, getting bigger and bigger. And we're on sort of more of a, okay, what can we actually achieve? What can we promise? And what, we can, what can we deliver? I don't want to be putting these things out in the ether that we can't necessarily achieve and deliver. And we should know we should, can't achieve and deliver them. I think we should be focusing on what we can achieve and making sure that we uphold our promises. You do have a lot of sacrifice, though. Absolutely. Are you ready for it? I think so. Yes, definitely. I'll tell you one thing I'm ready to sacrifice. This is just a conversation I had uh, yesterday was with the street chaplains came in and they said, we'd like your support via a letter. And I said, well, look, I, my goal is to be known as the most community-minded, hardest-working mayor that Perth's ever had. So what I would sacrifice to you guys, it wouldn't be a sacrifice, it would be a privilege, is one Saturday a month I'll go out on their Saturday night run, which starts at around about 10 o'clock and finishes at 6 in the morning. That's, I'll do that gladly because that's a promise that I know I can keep. So sacrificing my business, uh, would, would obviously I'd have to re readjust the way I, I, I work within my business. Effectively I'd have to move things aside because I will be, I don't do things in halves, so I will be a full-time, hands-on mayor that delivers everything he attempts to, uh, everything I set my mind to and everything I promise. I'll be able to deliver because I won't promise things that I cannot do. What about young ratepayers? What can you promise them? Young ratepayers? Well, one thing that I'm looking at, actually they're even younger than ratepayers, uh, I've committed to $50,000 of my allowance to go to creating a youth board. And that youth board would be young leaders within our community. Uh, they could be pre uh, prefix of local schools, basically seven or eight young leaders. And then that $50,000 will then go into pay it forward type projects. So if you imagine if we were to have an event, let's just say it was at the Wacker, and we had some high profile sporting stars come along, we had the children, we opened it up to our whole community, including the homeless, where we could have sausage sizzles, we could have backyard cricket type arrangements, we could have a whole community day. 
And then the power in that, well, can you imagine a, a young child talking to someone's homeless and that homeless person tells them their life story and they go, wow, really? You weren't born in the streets? You had a normal childhood? You went to a good school? What happened? And then all of a sudden it becomes real for them. There's other things that we can do with, with that Pay It Forward type um, project, whereas um, when I was at Make a Difference Foundation, we implemented a breakfast club. Mm. So it was around about 500 breakfasts a week that we were providing to local primary schools. And that cost, with sponsorship and with the PNCs coming on board at different schools, I think it was around about $5,000 out of our foundation, and it was matched by another organisation which was uh, that could supply food. That's 500 meals a week. Finally, what's your assurance to young ratepayers? Okay, so my assurance to young ratepayers is I know from my track record that I have a high level of integrity. I know that what I say are the things that I know that I can produce. So I don't make high promises on things that I believe are going to be outside what we can actually follow, follow up on. I know that I'm hard working. I've proved that through my 25 year career as a business person. If we get somebody who's independent, hardworking, with common sense decision making process as a mayor, I think we're in a good we will be in a good place. Bruce Reynolds, thanks for joining us and all the best. Thank you for having me. And now the AMAWA's president, Dr. Andrew Miller, has this week's COVID nineteen update. Hi, beautiful spring afternoon here in the COVID bubble of Western Australia and uh, thirty seven half million cases of COVID now worldwide out of the 7 billion on the planet and uh, well over a million deaths unfortunately from this disease. The US is in a mess, the UK is in a mess, uh, Spain certainly uh, going backwards, its largest city heading into lockdown. Here in Australia, pretty fortunate um, that we're not uh, living in Victoria where they're just completing six weeks of lockdown and really watching those numbers very closely and it must be um, tough there if you're running, trying to run a business or you've got kids at home, that sort of thing. It, it, it's a very difficult uh, um, thing to imagine when we're sitting here and, and none of this is going on because of uh, our border closures. So on the border, uh, we can't just leave it the way it was when we started out with the border just clamped shut. Uh, we do need to make it a smarter border and it's interesting to see the, the poll results uh, through WAMN News uh, that indicate that I think a lot of people in the community have realised that we need more fairness, more transparency, use of high tech in order to allow home quarantine, all of those things in order to keep us safe whilst at the same time acknowledging that it may be quite some time uh, before we get a vaccine. So. Uh, we saw a state budget which came down last week, which was largely uh, focused on uh, jobs, on infrastructure, and quite uh, unbelievably to me, not um, an increase in health spending. So health normally takes about 31% of the state budget and went down to 29% uh, in this budget, a bit over 9 billion, which sounds like an awful lot of money, uh, but they've promised 12 billion to spend on roads over the forward estimates. Uh, it gives you an idea that these are big figures we're talking about. And very disappointing that there's uh, no promise to fix up all of our hospitals to make them uh, properly COVID ready with uh, the engineering and the type of PPE that they're required. And no mention of the new women's hospital, which we know is required to be built down at uh, the, the QE2 site. No money committed to that. And I don't understand why you wouldn't do that for the women and the newborns of this state. So we have um, a bit of a trust deficit between healthcare workers and the um, state government. Uh, they've been doing the right thing on the borders, they've been making a lot of positive noises, but uh, we don't believe the political spin when push comes to shove because of the situation that we see in uh, Victoria. 3,500 infected healthcare workers there and now, in fact, the lockdown being prolonged mainly by infections among healthcare workers. So we're hoping the West Australian government will listen um, because they'll become unpopular if they don't, uh, e even if they just don't see the logic of uh, avoiding this disease in order to keep the economy uh, buzzing along the way it is at the moment. But in all the excitement of a 1.2 billion surplus, we'd like to see that money set aside for re-equipping our healthcare facilities with the proper ventilation, the proper workflows, the proper kind of workforce that we need going forward, instead of encouraging more people to come into nursing and all of these other jobs that we need, as well as doctors uh, within the system, 
they've instead um, frozen the pay again for another couple of years, less than CPI increases, so that we, we, as part of a budget repair measure from a few years back. We think this is short-sighted. We need uh, more and more people to go into healthcare at the moment. And so um, we'd encourage you to uh, speak to your politicians, to uh, get out there and make your views known that really Western Australia's success has been because we took the health threat seriously, but our hospitals are overcrowded. Uh, we have record ambulance ramping. However, the government wants to change the definition of it from time to time. It's much worse this year than it was last year. It's much worse under this government than it was even under the previous government when it was terrible. So these are factors that affect everyday West Australians' lives. You can't enjoy the booming economy unless you've also got uh, a great healthcare system. And at the moment, uh, it's looking pretty frayed around the edges. So uh, in terms of uh, Port Hedland, another uh, infected person in the, in the hospital up there, I'd like to say that we're completely confident that that's under control. Uh, but that will depend on whether the hospital has been properly equipped or not and whether the processes have been improved. Whilst the people from Perth are there, the, uh, the emergency assistance team, I, I don't doubt that, that things can be easily contained. But if we get other ships turning up with asymptomatic seafarers on them and it starts to spread into the community, that's when I fear uh, that we won't have the processes in place within, within these smaller hospitals like uh, your Port Headlands and your Broome and so on. Um, in order to deal with things. So the government says they're getting on with it, that they're starting to get these things organised, proper PPE for everyone, fit testing of, of masks and that sort of thing. But uh, I'm discouraged because I'm just not seeing the results happening on the ground. Uh, on a positive side, I always like to give you a positive side. I think if the community push for the smarter border, we'll start to see something happening there. And the vaccine is on the way. There will be an effective vaccine, I believe, before the end of 2021. But we have to plan for delays. We have to plan for unexpected outcomes. This disease uh, could be upon us at any time. So uh, it is a bit of a marathon. It is a bit of a long haul. Stay safe out there and we'll continue to plug the message that the government needs to put health first. Thank you for your time today. And that's all for this week. We'll be back next week with a final observation analysis on all candidates. But until then, it's back to you, Ivan and Sarah. Thank you very much indeed, Nelson. And that's our weekly news and current affairs. We have the latest news on our website and social media pages. No matter where you're watching, look after yourselves and we'll see you next Sunday. Wish you good health and take care. Good night. <laughs>